Um, I've had the uh, pleasure to, uh, to uh, meet uh, Dr. Shanine Pete and to hear her speak. She was a special guest at uh, one of my live events for the Segebuwak uh, Distinguished Storytellers Festival. She is a storyteller and she is an educator, someone that I respect and look up to uh, very much. And today, um, this morning, she's going to, uh, uh, she's on, here on behalf of the University of Regina and of course herself, but she's going to be presenting on indigenous presence and education. So at this time, please help me welcome Dr. Shanine Peet. Organize my temporary office here. I'm not, a, I'm not a podium person. I want to start by thanking Chris for the offer of tobacco, and I humbly accept this for this presentation today. I was really pleased to be able to uh, come here to this event today, and I'm very thankful that I come from a family of educators, and I'm sure many of you do as well. My grandmother was a teacher, my aunties and my uncles, many of them are educators. I've got a couple of them in the crowd today. Hi, aunties. <laughs> Thank you for shaping me into the teacher that I am today. I'm a graduate of the Indian Teacher Education Program. I did my master's degree in ed admin at the University of Saskatchewan and finished my PhD um, at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And I was really curious about schools and universities in particular because I wondered, how is it possible that settler folks can go through and be so successful in schooling, right from pre-kindergarten to grade 12, into university, and never know anything about us. Like, how did that happen? Why do they get the privilege of never learning anything about us? And then on top of it, they tell us they're afraid. But I'm afraid. I don't know how to approach you. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to teach Aboriginal education. And you think, yeah. You were systematically denied the opportunity to learn about Aboriginal people. And you should be really ticked off. Be ticked off at a system of education that made assumptions about you and what you should know. In the same way that for many of us in this room, we experienced a formal kind of education which also systematically denied us the opportunity to learn who we are, our histories and collective past, and about the uh, kind of strategies that will help us to achieve our vision for our collective future. So there's a problem in education, and I was trying to figure out how did that all go so badly? So I decided to study higher education administration. And I'll tell you, for that time period, they really didn't know much either. They really didn't. They were really barely wrapping their heads around feminism. They were really ba barely wrapping their heads around multicultural inclusion in the university. And they really had no idea about Native American history. And I just felt this burden of responsibility. You know, you not only have to talk about the women issues, but you gotta talk about all the, all the racialized issues. Suddenly people are asking me, so um, how do African American women experience leadership in education? And I'm like, why should I know? Why should I know? I'm trying to figure out what it means to me. <laughs> So higher education has been really struggling with this idea of diversity, and it's been really in particularly struggling with indigenization. In 2011, President Timmons at the University of Regina called together indigenous staff and faculty, and she said, I need your help. I need your help to consider how we can better support the students who are in our university, um, all of our students, to better understand indigenous people. And my colleagues had said, what we need to do is have a comprehensive plan on indigenization. And she said, okay, how would you like to do that? And they said, we'd like to define that. They started the Aboriginal Advisory Circle, which later became the Indigenous Advisory Circle. And they started off their first year by really trying to wrap their head around what does indigenization mean at the University of Regina? Because in our experience, for too long, Many people on the U of R side of the operations kind of had a hands-off approach to indigenization. They would say things like, that happens in SunTap, 
or that happens at First Nations University of Canada so that they wouldn't have to take any responsibilities for learning anything about Aboriginal people or removing the barriers for Aboriginal learners or making our work environment a safer place for staff and faculty. They just kind of had a you know, hands-off approach to that. So we defined indigenization as a shared responsibility to transform the academy through the inclusion of students and staff and faculty, indigenous ways of knowing and epistemic practices and creation of spaces, the physical spaces in the university that signal to all learners that indigenous knowledges are welcomed here and that we are exploring these ideas and their meaning they have for all of us. We also say that it's not just the work of Aboriginal people to take up this work, but every staff member, every faculty member must see themselves in taking a responsibility for this work. Not just because it's a good thing to do, because it's essential to our academic viability. Well, people were a little freaked out, as you can imagine, right? They were like, oh, Dr. Pete, that sounds very political. And my response back is, and you don't think white dominance and white superiority is political? Gulp. They hadn't realized, for many of our colleagues, the ways in which the university itself is shaped by whiteness. And they hadn't been honest in the way in which that's taken up and replicated within curriculum, within ideas of what leadership looks like, and ideas of who has power and who gets to inform change processes. They hadn't really been preparing themselves. And I get it. They were systematically denied the opportunity to learn about Aboriginal people in their K-12 experiences, and also through their post-secondary experiences. So how can we expect them to meet us halfway in this change process? Well, we really can't. And yet, at the same time, every single one of you, every single one of you, this young woman who spoke earlier, you have to intimately understand the systems of oppression that impact on our daily lives. I love the language you used earlier. You're talking about decolonization and colonialism. You're talking about sovereignty and self-determination. We have to speak like that because we have a responsibility of two-way knowing. And we have to communicate that because it's the um, very intimate experience we have with systems that oppress. We need to understand that really, really well. And yet at the same time, people who are privileged by dominance don't ever have to know it at all. So of course it sounds political to them, right? But it doesn't mean they're off the hook. My question to them is, so what work have you done? What have you read? Which speakers did you go listen to? What plays did you go and hear? Which scholars did you read? What work have you done to catch up to speed? Because frankly, indigenous people are up here. We're thinking from this starting point right here. And we've been able to do this for a really long time. So if your positioning is way back here because you've been structurally denied the opportunity to do something about it, you best make the effort to catch up. And I remind them too, like I'm not pissed off at you. I'm not angry with you. I'm impatient. <laughs> because we've had an over 30 year mandate in this province for the inclusion of Aboriginal content and it's been done poorly. It's been seen as optional by most dominant educators. And for the other part of it is they just kind of don't wanna. And there's no accountabilities to it, right? And during this 30-year time period, children have been born, they've been schooled, and they went on to post-secondary and adulthood and all that without the privilege of learning about us, except in informal ways. And that's disadvantaged every learner in this province. Every learner. Not just Indigenous learners, but white learners too, who don't know anything about us. And on top of that, as we diversify this province and we take in new settlers or new immigrant people and refugees, we have to be really conscious that it's to their benefit to adopt dominance as their way of knowing so that they can fit in at the expense of us. 
And we must play a really active role in disrupting that noise because we can't allow that to go on because they'll be our oppressors next. You can see that in the evidence of things happening in taxi cabs around this country. So indigenization is a huge effort and it certainly is political. And it certainly is more than just bringing in Aboriginal content or serving Indigenous students and hiring Aboriginal faculty. It's really about the disruption of dominance in every single element of the university. When I stepped into the role of executive lead, I started to do strategic planning because I'm an administrator, you know, uh, not just a teacher. I want to figure out how we decolonize universities and I want to be actively involved in that work. So with my colleagues, I started strategic planning and we came up with five key areas for our collective work that was going to drive our work forward for the next five years. We said certainly we want to make sure that there's a variety of student supports in the university. We want to be able to have first year retention programs. We want to have transitional programming that allows students to see success between year one and four. And we want students to have greater opportunities to go on to graduate school. That way, we can begin to recruit more faculty. So student supports is a big piece. And community engagement is also really important. So I've been visiting First Nations communities in the Treaty 4 area. I've been just dropping in, saying hi, talking to them about our strat plan, talking with them about how indigenization works. And I've been countering the questions that they naturally have. Because, um, you know, I've had some connections with First Nations University. And sometimes they wonder, does indigenization at the U of R, is it meant to undermine First Nations University of Canada? And I say certainly not. It's never our intention to take anything away from FNU, but to also take responsibility for the learners that we have. Because there's 1,661 self-declared First Nations University, or sorry, First Nations and Métis students at the U of R. And we have responsibilities to them, just like we have responsibilities to the 14,000 students who are not Indigenous, who come into our university. I want every single one of them to graduate with a better understanding than they earned when they were in K-12. So community engagement's really important. And we're beginning discussions about what kind of community-based academic programming needs are needed out in our communities. And we're also asking the question, what are your community-identified research needs and interests that we might be able to work alongside you on? So that's a starting point to those relationships. And I think it's a really helpful place for us to be right now. The third piece that I think is really important is about um, supporting and enhancing our ability to engage in Indigenous research. And we've been really um, fortunate for the last number of years to be working uh, with staff and the director from the Indigenous People's Health Research Centre. But it's, it's been productive, it's been really positive, it's made some major contributions nationally, but we need to be doing more. I went to the Faculty of Engineering and I asked that faculty, there was about this many of them in that faculty and I said to them, how many of you are interested in water quality? And about a third of them put their hands up. And so I said, okay, amongst you third, how many of you have existing research partnerships with First Nations? And no hands went up. No hands went up and yet this is a primary concern for them in their research and they haven't developed any relationships with us. I don't know about you, but that's not good enough. So I said, I'll take you on a road trip, we'll travel Treaty 4, we'll go visiting, I'll introduce you to some people. Maybe this will help us to start this process in a good way. There's two pieces that I wanted to talk about in particular um, and place more emphasis on them in this discussion. The fourth part of our strategic plan has to do with academic indigenization because frankly, we cannot leave it to the good graces of um, non-native faculty to pick up the ideas of indigenization and do it well because they don't have the experience. They've been structurally denied the opportunity to learn those ways, right? Because of their own fear, because they don't know. They don't really build good relationships with us. And so they need a lot of support. And I've been spending the past three years working with non-native faculty to help them understand what indigenization means and what that means for their own teaching work. And at first, they're really kind of freaked out, right? They think, um, don't I just add you know, in an English class, 
indigenous scholars into my course content. And I'm like, that's a start, but you better darn well anticipate the racism that's going to rise up because of that. Because non-native learners have no experience with the content and they don't understand the history of residential schools and they ask questions that are frankly kind of racist. So they ask things like this in class. Well, why didn't they just leave the residential school if it was so bad? Or they ask, why didn't their parents go and get them? Without realizing there's a whole other context out there that can't really be covered in that English 110 class unless the faculty member's prepared to deal with it. And so unfortunately what happens, and it's probably happened to you too, because it certainly happened to me, is that many of us end up being culture brokers in the classroom, right? So we end up being targeted. Can you please tell us about the history of residential schools so that we can better understand the context of that poem? And can you do it in six minutes? Right? Unrealistic expectations unrealistic burden placed on Indigenous learners. An unrealistic burden that is not expected of members of the dominant group who don't have to know, not responsible for, and can ask those kinds of questions without any kinds of requirement to do the work necessary to figure it out for themselves. Not fair. Not fair. So faculty need to wrap their heads around what it means to authoritatively and productively indigenize their curriculum practices. And it can't just be about brow adding brown content and stirring, right? They have to anticipate racism, oppression. They have to anticipate stereotyping and bias. They have to anticipate conflict. And in my experience, white educators, they're not so good at conflict. They like it nice pleasant, fun. Let's talk about dinosaurs today because that's politically neutral. Isn't that fun? Let's do that. You know, they don't have the skill set that we have. We've cultivated a big skill set around conflict, haven't we? <laughs> we know how to deal with it interpersonally. We know how to deal with it in, re in relation to legislation and municipal, or in terms of governance changes. We got some experience over here. Experience that often goes unrewarded and unacknowledged. So white folks struggle. They, they really struggle with the racism piece. And while they want to do something good, they haven't really thought through what that's going to mean or look like in the classroom. So I've been spending a lot of time with them, preparing them for the kinds of conflicts that will likely emerge as they do this work more intensely. And at the same time, their colleagues are giving them a hard time about it. They're saying things like, well, if you offer that class, I won't have as many learners in my classics class. They're worried about the canon. They think that somehow bringing Aboriginal content in is going to diminish what they've always taught. You know, that old recycled content list, course outline, that they really feel passionate about. But in some cases, it hasn't changed in 20 years. And so they're worried that somehow they're going to lose power and they are. They're going to lose some power. They're going to have to give something up because the privilege of holding on to and defining what is knowledge in the academy is no longer theirs alone. It's ours to define as well. And that work is political. So I've been sharing with them all different kinds of resources, resources that will help them to build their capacity to understand intergenerational trauma been offering them professional development opportunities so that they can begin to work with content in a different way. And more recently, we adopted a program of study called Aboriginal Voices that was created through the U of S's uh, Gwenamas Center. And we've adopted that model as our, our model for professional development with our faculty. So I'm really thankful for that gift that's been offered to us. Uh, we decided we just didn't going to spend the resources to create something that's already been done so well. So we'll utilize it and we acknowledge that partnership in the work that we do. The last, part of our, um, the last part of our strategic plan is an area that I think really involves a lot of you and has to do with governance and leadership. I've been actively shoulder tapping people with your kinds of leadership skills, your type of leadership skills. That understanding of our history, that strong understanding of how to deal with conflict, that years of experience that you bring to the profession, because I want you on our Board of Governors and on our Senate 
We need to proactively plan to have Indigenous leadership right throughout the organization from the top all the way down to the student organization and, and governance structures. Because when we are all present throughout the system, it is harder for, us that to, for them to deny us the vision that we are trying to enact. And so I call on you to honestly um, think about the leadership qualities that you have and to consider applying for a position on our Board of Governors because our, your leadership is needed. And I ask for you to consider the leadership of the people sitting beside you and your own leadership skills and the potential for bringing those skills to one of the regional seats on our Senate. By having a presence in those places, we send a strong message not only to the university community, but to the community at large, that we are not just thinking Indigenous, we are acting Indigenous, we are being Indigenous, and we are uh, enacting change in such a way as to radically change the institutions in which we work, in which we study. Sounds like fun, eh? I'll see you later. <laughs>